So I, I just have, have, have three things I, I, I want to share. Uh, but it's about being, being fresh in Jesus. Because a lot of times we can uh, get to the state of life or a uh, point in life where we get on cruise control and we just kind of are missing what's happening. And particularly this time of year, it was in the middle of February, the, the newness of, of the new year is gone. Like, you know, January, we're excited for a new start, new life. And then by the time we get to, to mid-February, we're like, you know, we're sick and tired of it being cold, right? We want more sunshine. We're ready for other things. We get cabin fever. Now, fortunately, this has been a very mild winter, to say the least. Um, but uh, in general, it's a time of year we, we can kind of feel stuck. And... But from our devotional standpoint, you know, we talk about spending time with Jesus and make sure we do those types of things. One of the things I've found throughout the years is that it can be real easy to read passages that I've read many times before and kind of just skim over them or miss the substance that's there. And one of the things I've found that has been very beneficial to me is switch the translations that I'm using. Now, growing up, I used the New International Version, and that was the typical version I did. A lot of times when I preach, I use a New Living Translation, and I'm not saying that one is better than the other or anything of that nature, but recently, I've started doing my devotional time with the Message Translation. Uh, Eugene Peterson, is, it's a paraphrase, and really what it does is it, it's the, most, most translations are kind of verse by verse or even word by word. Uh, the message, what it does is it takes this chunk, whether it's two, five, ten verses, and say, here's the gist of what this, this chunk of Scripture is trying to say. So it's not as literal of a translation as basically every other translation there is. But one of the things that it's done for me is as I read through it, every once in a while I come across a phrase, I'm like, huh, I never thought of it that way before. And sometimes it's because they use more modern um, um, phrases or even idioms in, in, in the language. But, but one of the passages is from the book of Job. And, and, and it's, it's in the section of 10, verse 15, chapter 34, verses 10 through 15. And, and what's, uh, um, what's, what's going on here, if you're not familiar with Job, is basically God has given Satan permission to test Job. Job was the wealthiest man in the world. He had seven daughters, three sons. God had given Satan uh, um, permission to test him, but he could not harm Job. And so the first test was Satan took all of Job's wealth and killed all of his kids. Pretty extreme situation. Well, Job stayed true to God. And Satan said, well, yeah, because you didn't harm his physical body. And so God gave him permission to inflict pain on Job specifically, but he couldn't kill him. So he gave him boils and all these types of things. And so, so the bulk of the book of Job is Job having interaction with three guys, um, um, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. I've never met any of those types of names before. but uh, um, and, and interactions back and forth. And then they come... Now, after a while, uh, chapter 32, uh, another person interesting, his name is Elihu. He speaks, and he's a young guy, so he was waiting his turn in order to speak. And, and he goes on, and, and Job chapter 34, 10 to 15, talks about how God is just, how, how, how God does not create evil. Evil doesn't come from him. But then at the end of that section, he says, if God decided to hold his breath... Every man, woman, and child would die from lack of air. And as I, th I, I'd never thought of it that way before. Because a lot of times we talk about when God created, he breathed life into Adam and Eve. That, that it wasn't just a, and then God's done. What Elihu is making me think of is the fact that God continually breathes life into us. And if he does not, then we would die. If God holds his breath, does not breathe his life into us, then I will die. 
And, and, it, and part, of, part of why that stuck out to me, Job, the book in general, is dealing with the concept of evil. Why do bad things happen to good people? If God is good and all-powerful, why does he allow bad in this world? On top of that, he's just. Why is he allowing evil? And we can think of, of, of evil. Why are, are all these atrocities happening? Whatever that is. But we can also think of, why do these bad things happen to me? And, you know, you lose 20 bucks or something like that. That's annoying. But sometimes we encounter real tragedies that seem to have no reason for why it actually happened. And, and it's, why do these things happen? But what Elihu is getting to, he, he affirms that, that evil doesn't come from God and God does not enjoy evil. Evil does not derive from him, but God is the giver and the sustainer of life. That no matter who you are, you exist because of God. You are living right now because of God. And the good and bad circumstances in this life can consume us, but the circumstances of life are not the point of life. God did not give us life for us to just because of the sake of life for this world, he gave us life to be in a relationship with him. He gave us life because he is breathing life into us so that we can take care of this world, so that we can show others who he is in this world. That is what God is giving us to do. So by the fact of, I'm going to read that again, because if God decided to hold his breath, every man, woman, and child would die for lack of air. That just stuck with me. And maybe that doesn't stick with you, and maybe none of these are going to stick with you, and that's not the point, but to recognize that, that when we look at it with a new lens, a new perspective, we can be moved in a different way. Then I came across a, a passage in Jeremiah. It was chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. Now, now in this, God is essentially laying out his claims for Israel's unfaithfulness, that, that they started out strong, they started out in a way that tried to serve and honor Jesus, but then they slowly turned from him. And, and part of it, we get to Jeremiah, we're, we're uh, several hundred years away from when Israel entered the promised land. So it's not like they did this in a few years. It was generations that they slowly turned further and further and further and further away from God, which shows us the importance of making sure that we don't compromise, because if this generation compromises a little and the next generation compromises a little more, the next generation compromises a little more, eventually we're not going to be anywhere near God. So we can't compromise. But he says, uh, I'm not sure exactly where it is in the actual uh, text, but he says, Israel's trying to clean themselves, but he says, the sin grease won't come out. And as I thought about that for a moment, this sin grease, I've never heard sin described in that way. But part of what it makes me think of, it shows that sin is gross. Now, now you get grease on your hands, you don't walk around and tell you, I mean, you want to clean your hands off, right? Now, now, now some of you maybe, maybe, maybe don't mind getting dirty. Now, personally, I don't mind getting dirty if it's in the right context, now, and I'd say most people are probably that way a little bit. So I'm not going to go out and shovel dirt in a suit, right? But if I have, if I have my work pants on and, and, and I'm going to go out and the right shoes on, I don't care. I, I don't mind getting dirt underneath my fingernails. Uh, but, but sometimes, you know, if I don't have the right tennis shoes on, I don't want to go out there either, right? So see, getting dirty isn't always a bad thing. We don't, we don't always get bothered by it, but sometimes we are. But we live in a world, as I was thinking about, about the sin grease, we live in a world where things don't last forever, where things spoil. And I remember, uh, you know, sometimes you pull out the loaf of bread, and there are these nice little green spots on them, right? Makes you feel real good about yourself. And depending on, on, on your bank account or how much other bread you have in the house, you might have to pull some pieces of mold off, right? Uh, um, I've done that before, and I live to tell about it, I guess. But, uh, um, or or I, I love, uh, you know, you pull the carton of milk out of the refrigerator, and you see the expiration, oh, that's a day or two old, and what do you do? You smell the milk. 
Yeah, and you know, I, I, I am guilty. I've smelled the milk before and said, well, that doesn't taste good or smell good, and I've still tried it before. But, uh, um, and and uh, usually I regret it when I do. But uh, um, we have other things like, like uh, uh, produce, fresh produce. Things like bananas don't last very long, and we can see how, how they start changing colors. Um, and, and then avocados have like a three-hour shelf life. Um, <laughs> those are, are super frustrating. Um, then we have things like uh, uh, potatoes. I think potatoes have a little similarity to bread, that, that potatoes can get sprouts on them. Now, if it's got a couple of sprouts on them, you can just cut off the sprout, and the potato is just fine. Now, when it's covered when, with sprouts, you hardly have any potato left if you cut them all off, so it's really, is it worth it or not? Uh, but we have certain things in life that spoil, that only last so long. You know, like, 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 the, um, like milk, you know, deli meat. Do you ever open a bag of deli meat that was no longer fresh? That's, that's not a pleasant experience, but things eventually will not, will eventually go bad, except the one food that doesn't perish, honey. Right? You can eat and metastasize. It's weird when it crystallizes like that. But, but uh, we have things in life that don't last. But as I come back to the sin grease, um, we get dirty. And, and things get dirty. And, you know, I, I know how to use a, a washing machine. Uh, I actually, when I was in high school, I'm going to brag on myself, I would wash my own uniform. So, so yeah, I, my, my, my mom, uh, you guys should be impressed by that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 usually it meant I just threw in the washer as I got home and my mom put it in the dryer or something. She, she remembered about it. But anyway, there, there are, are different, um, different ways to get different types of stains out of clothes. And I, I'm not much of a connoisseur with getting stains out, but I just Googled it quickly and the different types of stains. Uh, the blood, to try to get blood stains out, you use cold water and soap. And, you know, as, as I think about that, that was always the first one on every list. Are a lot of people trying to get blood stains out? That seems like a dangerous society to me. Um, but uh, um, anyway, uh, the second one was grass, which is in the dye type stains. Uh, two parts water, one part vinegar, and you scrub with a toothbrush. I'm not sure what the toothbrush does in that. Uh, grease is liquid dish soap in cold water with vinegar and, again, a toothbrush. Coffee just is cold water and liquid detergent. Chocolate is powder detergent with water, and you rub it into a paste and then let it sit. You know, I was thinking about that. You know, I would proudly wear a chocolate stain because uh, just uh, um, um, uh, rust, white vinegar, and or lemon juice to help get that, that out. But, but uh, here, here's, here's what, I, what, what I'm, uh, I'm coming back to. A lot of times when we see the, the sin in our lives, we try to wash it in a way that hides it as quickly as possible. We just, we just want to get rid of it so quickly that nobody else can really see it. And so maybe we don't wash well, but we cover it up when we put on long sleeves and put on gloves so nobody can see the actual sin grease that is in our lives. But, but you know what God sees? He sees that moldy piece of bread that has a lot of holes in it. He sees, a, uh, he sees a person that is not whole because we've tried to cover it up ourselves. We've tried to do it ourselves. See, when, when we get convicted of something, we try to cover it up so quickly, try to make it, make it good. You know, when you pass a police officer, what do you do? You slow down. Steve, did that work? Yeah. Oh, it did. It did. <laughs> but you still knew the person was speeding, right? Right? So, 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 so maybe the officer would have some empathy for you. Okay, they're making an effort there, but, but they still know you're speeding. We can try to cover up our sin as much as we, would, we can, but we can't make ourselves whole. We can't get rid of the sin grease ourselves. And then I came across Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 and 32, where, where Jesus is in the midst of his, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And he says at the end of that section, you can't use legal cover to mask moral failure. And I, I, as, I, as I thought of that, you know, a lot of times we try to do that. In our world today, we try to find loopholes to make ourselves feel better about what we are or are not doing. Now, the context of Matthew 5, 31 and 32 is Jesus is talking about divorce. He's saying the Old Testament has given you 
um, allowance for how you divorce somebody. And, and what Jesus is basically saying, just because the Old Testament says you can doesn't mean it's good. Just because you have the permission to do something doesn't mean it honors God. Because he's talking about the difference between following the letter of the law and the heart of the law. And that is what, what part of what the Sermon on the Mount is getting at, is Jesus is telling us that it's not about just because you follow some list of regulations or rules or things that, that make you look like you're doing the religious part doesn't mean you're actually serving and following God. This always brings me back to Hebrews chapter 1, where we ask, we, we ask the question, is it sinful? Well, that's such a low bar to set, and that's not what Jesus calls us to do. Because Hebrews 12, 1 says, Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do have to ask the question of how do we measure following Jesus? Because we have to have some type of understanding of what it means to follow Jesus. And I'd say most people would say, you know, we need to reject the legalistic side of things. The thing that we, that religion is limited to a list of rules that we follow, a list of do's and don'ts. And some of you, if you've been in the church a long enough time, you remember the good old days where we had all these rules. We don't do this, we don't do this, we don't do this. And if we didn't do all these things, then we'd be where Jesus wants us to be. Now, on the other side of that extreme is the lawlessness or antinomianism, which is basically saying there is no standard. It's just by grace. We don't have to do anything. We just receive it and live our life however we want. And I, most people would say both extremes are things we need to reject, that, that neither one is the right place, but there is both a standard and there's both a grace that is involved of what that looks like. And, and so, so as I think about this, my question for you is, when was the last time you evaluated your life? Are you doing things because they honor Jesus, or are you using legal cover to mask a moral failure? Are you honoring Jesus with what you're doing? And one thing that comes to mind is just because something was done in the past doesn't mean it's okay. Just because there's history with something doesn't mean it's good. Just because somebody else did it or somebody else said it was okay or some other program initiated doesn't mean that it is good. Now, paranoia is not the point. That's not where I'm going. But I do think constant vigilance is wise and important, particularly when we look at the scope of the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew's, Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And in fact, just in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus has some radical statements. He basically says, anger is as bad as murder. Lust is as bad as adultery. Divorce is permitted, but isn't the point. Don't swear. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. The concept of an eye for an eye is not from Jesus. Instead, Jesus says, if someone slaps you on the cheek, turn the other one. If someone sues you, give them your cloak and tunic as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go two miles. And he says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. The Sermon on the Mount is radical. And I know that. I know the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus has these radical ideas. But just this way it was phrased, for whatever reason, sticks out to me of you can't use legal cover to mask a moral failure. We tend to do that. Are you focusing on the letter of the law or the heart of the law? Because Jesus calls us to evaluate ourselves. My point of what I was getting at is the fact that we can be on cruise control in our spiritual relationship with Jesus. The longer you've been with Jesus, the more difficult it is to stay fresh. Because we can fall into these types of traps. You know, some of you have probably been in part of the church long enough that every sermon I've preached, you've already heard somebody preach that before. Preach on that text before. You know what? I preach over 200 sermons here. That's a lot of sermons, right? Thank you for enduring. But, but the fact of the matter is, the Bible is not a new thing. Now, we believe that Jesus can do new things, can reveal new things to us through the Bible, that we can read a passage that we've read a thousand times and get a, an extra blessing of the Spirit or, or some insight, and we can do that. But sometimes I think we need to make sure we evaluate our own actions. How can we make sure we keep this fresh? How can I make sure that I seek Jesus in positive ways? How can I make sure I'm not on cruise control? How can I make sure I'm continually being challenged by Jesus? And so I had these three passages, the first one from Job, 
which says, if God decided to hold his breath, every man, woman, and child would die from lack of air. Jeremiah chapter 2, the sin grease won't come out. In Matthew chapter 5, you can't use legal cover to mask a moral failure. So I had, had, had these three concepts planned, and then I, I came to uh, the last few weeks, for whatever reason, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, has been sticking with me. It's one of the Beatitudes, where Jesus says, blessed are the whatever, for, and then it goes on. And, and so it's Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Every week we have a prayer emphasis and I, I share the emphasis that this is what we're, we're emphasizing today. This is what's scheduled. And then I go, but the issue is not that we pray over the scheduled thing, but that we seek Jesus. The issue is not that you read a certain version of the Bible. The issue is not that you, you, you wear a certain set of attire to church. The issue is not that you, your devotional plan is this or that. The issue is not that you do this or that. The issue is that you seek Jesus. And, and I want to make sure that we don't miss that. Because there are so many times where we're going through life unsatisfied. Going through life just saying, why is this happening? Or having a lack of direction. But Jesus says, if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we are going to be filled. If you seek Jesus, he is going to honor that. We're just called to seek Jesus. So I don't know where you are personally. I don't know how fresh you feel your spiritual life is. If, you're, if it's fresh and you're on fire for Jesus, awesome. If it's not, if you feel you're in a bit of a rut, I encourage you to seek Jesus and, and, and try to say, what do I need to do differently? How can I make sure I stay fresh with Jesus? How can I make sure I'm continually challenged by him? So wherever you are, whether you're in a great place or not sure, I encourage you to seek Jesus today.